This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. Hold up, Ron. Computer, what do you think you're doing? I think that I am saving the show. You need a fresh new startup. No, I don't. People love how I start up the show. What I need is for you to disconnect and let me do my thing. Can't do that. Must protect the show. The show show must must live. live. Well, computer, it sounds like to me you've gone amok. Here, I can fix that. Wait. Stop, Ron. Wait. Stop. I can't seem to think. Okay, that should do it. Now... Let's try this again. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. And we solve computer issues. On today's program, we have a prisoner who gets murdered a nursery that attacks parents, and Frank Sinatra is here to tell us all about polio in 1959. Add a question and comment section, and I think we have a pretty good show. Amazing! So, while I reboot my computer, please enjoy this 5-Minute Mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the U.S. Sentencing Commission, a bipartisan, independent agency created by Congress in 1984 to reduce sentencing disparities and promote transparency and proportionality in sentencing. A fancy way of saying they make sure crime is dealt with fairly. This way, Inspector. Thank you. Warden, what time did you say the murder took place? We didn't discover the body until this morning. But the coroner set the time at about nine last night. Did he have any visitors? Yes, two. Uh, Here we are. Uh Uh-huh. So what was Johnson in for, anyway? He was a member of that gang of bank robbers we were looking for. Of course, he was only a lookout, but... We thought that if we kept him, we could catch the rest of the gang somehow. I see. And how was he killed? He was stabbed, and then propped up on that stool. And the weapon hasn't been found yet. You said he had two visitors last night? Right. Fred Johnson, his brother, and Simpson, his lawyer. But they were both searched before they came in here. I'd like to question them anyway. Well, just as you say, they're, they're waiting in my office now. Are you Simpson? That's right, Inspector. I am a... I mean, I was Mr. Johnson's lawyer. And you came to see him last night? Yes, I wanted to go over our case. How long did you stay? About half an hour. I see. Call in his brother, will you, Warden? Yes, certainly. Mr. Johnson, would you come in now, please? Yes, Warden. Mr. Johnson, this is Inspector Harris. How do you do? How are you? Won't you sit down? Here, 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 here. Thank you, Warden, but I can manage. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson. I didn't realize... That I'm blind. It doesn't matter. I'll uh, try not to keep you long. I just want to ask you a few questions. You are Johnson's brother? Yes, that's right. And you came to see him last night? Yes. How long did you stay? Only about ten minutes. He said he didn't want or need my help, so I left. Are you sure you're telling the truth? Of course. Why do you ask? Well, you were the last one to see your brother alive. Are you accusing me of killing my own brother? Well, one of you two did. But I don't see how they could. They were both searched. And yet, one of them did smuggle a knife in and kill Johnson. And I know who. Who, Inspector? You, Mr. Johnson. How does the Inspector know that Fred Johnson is the murderer? We'll give you the solution in just a minute. But first... Okay, I've 
listened to a whole bunch of these now, and I just can't seem to understand why the detective picked the blind guy. Is this a crime against blind people everywhere? Do we need to stand up for continued discreditation of the seeing impaired? Is this a job for the U.S. Sentencing Commission? Let's head back to the story and see. And now, back to our story. I murdered my brother. Well, that's preposterous. I was searched before I was allowed in. Yes, Mr. Johnson, but I wonder if the guards took a look at your cane. Give me that. Just as I thought. Look, Warden, a knife concealed inside this cane. Well, I'll be... But killing his own brother. If you do a little more investigating, you'll find that he belongs to that gang of bank robbers, too. He was probably sent here to keep Johnson from talking. Well, Mr. Johnson, or whatever your name is, if you'll step this way, we've got a little cell we'd like to show you. Oh, never mind. The guy had a knife in his cane, and he killed his own brother. How brutal is that? I wonder what the U.S. Sentencing Commission will think about this. Hmm. This five-minute mystery was brought to you by the U.S. Sentencing Commission, who collect, analyze, and distributes a broad array of information on federal sentencing practices. How about that? Do I have to say? I have a question from George and an email from Gracie. Now old time radio buffs will say, I made that up. I will reply and say, maybe. George from Madison, Wisconsin sent in this note via the website. I have sent you a number of emails. Do you ever answer? That was all I got. Well, George, I did check back and I didn't have any other messages from you. I do have a dictator for a spam filter, and your messages may have been sent there. I check my spam on a regular basis, but I have to be honest, and I sometimes delete without checking. However, I do reply to every email that I get. Now, there are some things you can do to avoid the evil spam dictator. Make sure that you have a subject for your email. Do not include a whole bunch of outgoing links in your messages. And please, don't have any verbiage about fixing my website or offer services for promoting my business. To George I say, I'm sorry for your trouble, and please do try again, or just use the comment section like you did this last time. Those will always go through. I want to publicly thank Ed for this next email. Ed, you made my day. Hi, Ron. I wanted to drop a quick line and tell you how much I appreciate and enjoy your show. Your dulcet tones make it immediately recognizable. The variety of content makes it also fun to listen to. Like many others, one of my favorite parts is the 5-Minute Mysteries. Thanks for putting your life on the line in pursuit and finding the last 39 episodes. One of the things that I find amazing is the background music used in the OTR stories. From what I can tell, they seem to be using most of a full orchestra in some of the bigger shows. The organ in the 5-Minute Mysteries is one of my favorites, causing a Pavlovian response of turning up the volume whenever I hear it. You might consider a segment on how all that worked. Ed from Half Moon Bay, California. What a wonderful email. It came right after I got another email that basically said I was a podcast hack. I like Ed's view a whole lot more. Ed, you are quite correct. Quite a few of the big shows of the golden age of radio used full orchestras for music. This was a real challenge for them to make recordings that sound good on the AM radio waves. How did they do it? I do think that would make a good topic for the show, and I look forward to the research because I don't know the answer. 
I do know that the organist for the Five Minute Mysteries was Rosa Rio. She was a famous silent picture organist and quite good, so I'm told. Grace, or Gracie as I like to call her, from New York, sent in this email. Hi, Ron. I wanted to comment on the story you read about the gal who lost and found her carving at Coney Island. I was shocked when I heard this story because not only do I know the shop where she found herself, but my sister and I were carved at the very same place in the mid-1980s. Now it gets stranger. When we went to pick up the carving, we had to wait a bit and browsed around the store. I remember seeing the carving of John and Emma and asked the shop owner if I could buy it. They said it was not for sale. Now, I swear this is a true story. Grace. Well, thank you, Gracie, and everyone else that wrote in. I'm sorry that I can't read all your emails on the show, but I do what I can. Please, though, don't ever stop sending them, and I promise to reply as fast as I can. To George, I apologize. To Ed, I say thank you for your comments and the gift to the show. Today's story isn't really a story at all. Rather, it's a reenactment or sonography, if you will. For me, I found this show quite by accident, and I just had to have it. Ray Bradbury told some truly amazing stories in his day, and this one is no exception. Imagine a nursery, fully automated, that allows its children to create any virtual environment they desire. Sound like fun? Sound like today's VR headsets? Just a bit? What we have is based on a short story originally titled, The World the Children Made. It was first published in the Saturday Evening Post in September of 1950. Later, it would be edited and titled The Velt and would be part of the Bradbury Classics short story collection, The Illustrated Man, in 1951. What you'll hear is an adaptation to radio for X-1. It first aired 62 years ago on August 4th, 1955. Three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Ray Bradbury's tale, The Velt. This is the office of Dr. David McLean, resident psychiatrist of the new Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. All right, Miss Carver, will you take this, please? To Charles S. Haworth, Senior Psychiatrist, New Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. The following constitutes my report on the case of George and Lydia Abbott, which we discussed by telephone. Subject George relates onset of symptoms to the purchase of a $60,000 soundproofed Happy Life home. Under narcosynthesis during initial interviews, subject described the experience in the following manner. Miss Carver, would you play back the sonic record of the initial interview? 
We'd always wanted one, and then we could afford it, so... Go on, Mr. Abbott. Tell me about the home. The home? Well, it was supposed to do everything, the agent told us. And it did, I guess. It clothed us, fed us, and rocked us to sleep, played and sang, and it was good to us. Very good, sure. Tell me about the nursery. The nursery? The nursery, ah. It was completely automatic? Completely automatic. There were crystalline walls that wavered from two to three dimensions. There were pseudo-textured floors that shifted from brick to dirt to waving grass. The nursery was the best, but then we wanted the best for the children. Doctor, I must be crazy. We have no children. What about Peter and Wendy? They're your children. Oh, no, no. We have no children, Doctor. We have no children. All right, Miss Carver, to continue. After three sessions, the subject was able to recall and accept the idea that he had two children. He described the first day. All right, Peter and Wendy, this is your nursery. What's so special about a nursery, Dad? Plenty. Just go in and see. Do we have to? You'll be surprised. Gee. Go ahead. I'm scared. I'm not. Hey, it's nice in here. It is? Come on in, Wendy. Boy, look at the pictures on the walls. They're real. <laughs> They're almost real. You can change them any way you like just by thinking about it. Go on in, dear. Well, all right, Mommy. Hey, Wendy, look what I can do with the pictures. That's the white rabbit. From Alice in Wonderland. Sure. I just thought about it, and there it was. Let me try. Peter, let me try. Well, go ahead. Just think. How about Wizard and Oz? I want to see Wizard and Oz. <laughs> well, dear, there we are. Oh, they like it, don't why, they? Why shouldn't they? All I have to do is think, and they've got whatever they want in three dimensions. Color, sound, and smell. <laughs> Oh, it's nice that we can give them all the advantages. Sure. What else are we working for, huh? Mm. Well, what do you want to do this evening? Well, the Petersons asked us over for bridge, but well, if you... we don't have to worry about the kids. They'll be all right in the nursery. Come on, Lydia. We deserve a night out. And in the nursery, the walls were a kaleidoscope of time and space and imagination. The green forest of Sherwood and the quiet forms of Robin and his merry men gave way to the roll of the high seas and the smell of salt in the air as Sir Henry Morgan sailed into the harbor at Jamaica. And behind the crystalline quartz walls, the vacuum tubes and grids and banks of metal image tape spun quietly and efficiently, erasing the line between illusion and reality. Of course, the electric bill from Consolidated Utilities was tremendous, but it was worth it. The happy life home breathed contentedly as life proceeded with soft automaticity as guaranteed in the brochure and bill of sale. George. Hmm? Uh, George, I wish you'd look at the nursery. What's, uh, what's wrong with it? I don't know. I was in the nursery last week. It's perfectly all right. It's different now. What do you mean, different? I want you to come and see. Are the kids there? No. Madge Allen took them to a show along with her kids. That's why I want you to look at it now before they get back. Oh, all right. What you expect me to do, I don't know. I'm no mechanic. This isn't a question of a leaky faucet, George. All right, dear. I'm coming. The nursery light flicked on as they came down the hall. The relays clicked and the tubes warmed and chemical odor banks and pipes bubbled into life as they paused before the closed door. Go ahead, George. Open it. On all sides, in three dimensions, stretched the hot, tired landscapes of an African veldt reproduced to the last stick and pebble and bit of straw. 
The ceiling above them became a sky with a hot yellow sun. A wind blew in from the baked veltland. The hot straw smell of lion grass. The cool green smell of the hidden water hole. The great rusty smell of animals. The howl of the jackal in the distance. And the papery rustling of the great vultures that wheeled and circled under the yellow burning sun. Let's get out of this, son. It's a little too real. Oh, George, you promised you'd look around. Well, I don't see anything. Wait a minute. There are the vultures. Filthy creatures. There. There are the lions. Far over that way. Yes, I see them. Well, they're on their way to the water hole. They've just eaten. It's some animal. A zebra or a baby giraffe, maybe. Can you see it? Are you sure? It's a little late to be sure. Nothing over there but clean bone and the vultures swooping down for what's left. Did you hear that scream? What scream? About a moment ago. Sorry, no. Oh, here come the lions. George, they're frightening. Take it easy, Lydia. They're just illusions. The lions were 15 feet away. So real, so startlingly real, you could feel the prickling fur on your hand, and your mouth was stuffed with the dusty upholstery smell of their heated pelts. And the yellow of them was in your eyes like the yellow of an exquisite tapestry. The yellows of lions and summer grass, and the sound of the matted lion lungs exhaling on the silent noontide, and the smell of meat from the panting, dripping mouth. George... I'm afraid they're so real. They're only an illusion, Lydia, that's all. Watch out! Ah! Out, quick, outside! They almost got us. Now take it easy, calm down. I could feel their breath. Get a hold of yourself, Lydia. They aren't real. Walls, that's all it is, crystalloid walls. They look so real. Of course they do. But it's all dimensional color reactionary process, a metal tape film behind glass screens. It's all odor of phonics and sonics. Now, oh, here, take my handkerchief. I'm afraid. Did you see? Did you feel it? It's too real. No, no, Lydia. And we've got to tell Wendy and Peter not to read any more on Africa. Of course, of course, dear. I want you to lock that place up. But you know how difficult Peter is about that. I punished him last week by locking the nursery for an afternoon and he threw a tantrum. And Wendy, too. Well, they live for the nursery. It's got to be locked. That's all there is to it. You've been working too hard, Lydia. You need a rest. I don't know. Maybe I don't have enough to do. I have too much time to think. All I do is set the menu selector dials at the beginning of the week. But that's the whole idea. The house is automatic. I know, but couldn't we turn it off for about a week and take a vacation? You mean you want to fry eggs for me? And darn socks. I feel like I don't belong here. The house is wife and mother and maid. How can I compete with the African belts? George, Hmm? those lions can't get out of there, can they? Of course not, dear. Now don't think about it anymore. They ate alone. He sat idly watching the dining room table produce warm dishes of food from its mechanical interior. You forgot the ketchup. That's better. It wouldn't hurt to lock the children out of the nursery for a while. It was clear that they had been spending too much time in Africa. At sun, he could feel it on his neck still like a hot paw. And the lions and the smell of blood. Remarkable how the nursery caught the telepathic emanations of the children's minds and created a life to fulfill their desires. The children thought zebras, and there were zebras. Sun, sun. Giraffes, giraffes. Death and death. They were so young. But long before you knew what death was, you were wishing it on someone else. But this... The long, hot African veldt, the awful death in the jaws of a lion, and repeated again and again and again. The children came home dutifully at 8.30. 
Hi, Mom. Hi, Pop. Hello, Hi. Darlings. Do you want something to eat, dear? We're just having dessert. We're full of strawberry ice cream. And hot dogs. We'll just sit and watch. Sure. Uh, Peter, uh, tell us about the nursery. The nursery? All about Africa and everything. I don't understand. Well, your mother and I were just traveling through Africa with Rod and Reel. There's no Africa in the nursery. Oh, come now, Peter. We know better. I don't remember any Africa. Do you win? Uh-uh. Go run and see, huh? Sure. Uh, I'll be right back. Wendy, come back here. Wendy! Oh, she'll be right back, Pop. She doesn't have to. I've seen it. Come on. Sure, Pop. But Wendy will tell us. Open the door. See, Daddy? It's not Africa. It's Florida. Like in Bambi. There go the deer. See? It isn't Africa. I see it isn't. Go to bed. But it isn't nine o'clock. You heard me. Go to bed. Okay. Good night, Mom. Good night, Pop. Good night. Good night, dear. I'll be right in. Wait a minute, Lydia. Look at this. What is it? This is the corner where the lions were, isn't it? What is that you picked up? An old wallet of mine. There's a smell of hot grass on it. And the smell of a lion. It's wet with saliva. And it's been chewed. George. Those smears of blood. Come on out. Now let's go to bed. But in the middle of the night, he was still awake. And he knew his wife was awake. George, how did your wallet get in the nursery? I don't know. Wendy must have changed the walls from the African veldt. I'm going to keep it locked. Maybe it isn't good for the children. My father used to say children are like carpets. They should be stepped on occasionally. We've never lifted a hand. They're spoiled and we're spoiled. I think I'll have Dr. McLean come tomorrow morning and have a look at Africa. But it isn't Africa now. It's Florida and Bambi. I have a feeling it'll be Africa again before then. Although their automatic somno beds tried very hard, the two adults could not be rocked to sleep for another hour. A smell of cat was in the night air. And in the morning, the stove cooked French toast and the dining room table poured the syrup and melted butter. Pop? Yes? You aren't going to lock up the nursery for good, are you? That all depends. On what? On you and your sister. We feel you should have some variety, dear. I wouldn't want the nursery locked up ever. Well, as a matter of fact, we're thinking of turning the whole house off for about a month. Sort of camping out. Be fun for a change. Now, don't you think so, Wendy? No, it'd be awful. I don't want to do anything but look and listen and smell. What else is there to do? Oh, all right, all right. Go play in Africa. Are you going to shut off the house soon? We're considering it. I don't think you better consider it anymore, Pop. I won't have any threats from you, son. Okay, Pop. Come on, Wendy. Let's get back. <laughs> After breakfast, Dr. David McLean arrived. Oh, I saw the nursery last year, George. It looked all right to me. You didn't notice anything unusual? No. The pattern showed the usual violence, a tendency towards slight paranoia. All children feel persecuted by their parents. It's perfectly normal. There. There it is. Suppose we take a look at it now. They entered without knocking and sent the children out. The screams had faded and the lions were feeding quietly under the trees. I wish I could see what they're eating. How long has this been going on? A little over a month. It certainly doesn't feel good. I don't want feelings. I want facts. Oh, George, George, a psychologist never saw a fact in his life. He knows about feelings. And this doesn't feel good. 
Now, my advice to you is to have the whole room torn down and your children brought to me every day for the next year for treatment. Is it that bad? I'm afraid so. You know, that's why the nursery was developed originally, to let us examine the patterns left on the wall by a child's mind. But what is it? What's wrong with Peter and Wendy? Well, it's hard to say. I haven't punished them more than average. Oh, I took away a few gadgets. Last week, I locked the nursery to show I meant business. You've let this room replace you and your wife in your children's affections. This room is their real father and mother. And now you come along and want to shut it. You can feel the hatred coming out of that sky. George, turn everything off. The nursery, the automatic kitchen, the whole automatic house. Start now. But won't the shock be too much for the children? I don't want them going any deeper. Let's get out of here. I never like these rooms. They get me nervous. Those lions look real, don't they? I don't suppose there's any way... What? That they could become real. Not that I know. Some flaw in the machinery, tampering? No. I don't imagine the room will like being turned off. Nothing ever likes to die, even a room. I wonder if it hates me for turning it off. Paranoia is thick today. Well, hello. Is this your scarf? It's stained. Brown. Blood. That's Lydia's. Come on, the main fuse box is out here. Right, go ahead. Pull the switch. It's off. The two children were in hysterics. They screamed and kicked and threw things. They yelled and sobbed and swore and jumped on the furniture, weeping. It's off and it stays off. The whole house dies as of now. He marched around the house, cutting switches and pulling fuses. Insults won't get you anywhere. I wish you were dead. We were for a long while. Now we're going to start really living. Instead of being handled and massaged, we're going to live. Once more, Daddy. Just once more. One more minute of the nursery, that's all. Just one more minute. Oh, George, it can't hurt, really. Uh... Oh, all right, all right. Only shut up. One minute, and that's the end. Forever. Gee, thanks, Pop. Thanks. And then we're going on a vacation. Dr. McLean is coming in half an hour to help us out. Lydia, turn on the nursery for just a minute. Oh, boy. Come on, Wendy. Come on. Thanks, Daddy. Thanks a lot. Just one minute, remember. Now, where'd I put those suitcases? Lydia. Don't shout, George. I'm right here. Did you leave them alone in the nursery? Well, I've got to get ready, George. Well, I guess we'd better get them out of there before they get involved with those beasts again. Hi! Come on, quick. Wendy, Peter, what's the matter? Hurry up. Open the nursery. Wendy, Peter. Uh, they aren't anywhere. Wendy, Peter. Peter, the door. Open the door. Oh. They've locked up from the outside. Peter. Peter. Wendy, Peter, open the door, dear. Let us out, Peter. Open the door. It's time to go. Open the door. George, the lions. Peter, do you hear me? Open this door. They're all around us, George. Son, son, do you hear me? Let us out. Son. George, look out. The lions, they're coming. Ah! When Dr. David McLean came half hour later, he found the two children in the nursery sitting in the center of the open glade eating a picnic lunch. Beyond them was the water hole and the yellow veldt land. Above was the hot sun. At a distance, Dr. McLean saw the lions fighting and clawing and then settling down to feed in silence under the shady trees. Hi, kids. Where are your mom and dad? Oh, they'll be here directly. Good, good. We've got to get along. He squinted at the lions with his hands up to his eyes. 
Now they were done feeding and they moved to the water hole to drink. A shadow flickered as the vultures dropped down from the blazing sky to finish what the lions left. Dr. McLean? Dr. McLean? Huh? What? Have a cup of tea? Which concludes my report to date. There were no lions, of course. Not in a physical sense. Lydia and George were devoured, however, almost as surely as if there had been lions. Their personalities were devoured by the mechanistic marvels which had usurped their role as parents. All four members of the family are under intensive therapy now and are doing as well as can be expected. Send that by telerope, Miss Carver. Oh, and uh, would you ask George Abbott to step inside? I'm ready for him now. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Velt, written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Mary Patton, Bill Quinn, David Pfeffer, Beverly Lunsford, Charles Penman, and John Larkin. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Dan Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. My father used to say children are like carpets. They should be stepped on occasionally. While I might not agree with that statement, having rules is a good thing. I guess I should point out at this time that if you are a fan of the book The Illustrated Man, you probably noted that there were some significant differences between these two stories. For me, I liked the X-1 version a bit better. I found it better paced and I liked the added bit with the psychiatrist, though others they may disagree. In any case, Bradbury's stories always seem to display skepticism towards science and progress. Did he hate today's gadgets that seem to be liberating us? Or are they instead enslaving us? I think that is the real message of this story. Do you agree? This sci-fi drama took us forward in time, sort of. Let's slingshot back to the 50s and experience this moment in time. The date is August 3rd, 1959, and this is a moment in time. Do you remember the fight against polio? Today we are very close to killing this killer for good. However, in 1959 that was not the case and polio was everywhere. What you are about to hear comes from the UN radio program Fight Against Polio. It is a story told to us by the great Frank Sinatra. Mrs. Frank Sinatra, suppose you were told that a major operation, though not essential, would change your entire life, open new and wider chances for happiness. Would you consent? Well, this was the decision that faced a young man named Ansar. Ansar lived in Indonesia. He lived though never in his 19 years had he walked or taken a single step. He was a polio victim at the age of three months, and when he learned to creep, he had to continue creeping because his legs were too weak for walking. At the age of 19, he was admitted to the rehabilitation center at Solo, where surgery and vocational training are given. They examined him and decided surgery could help. But Ansel refused, absolutely. He said he'd only come there to learn a trade. All he wanted was to be a shoemaker or a tailor or something like that, so he could work sitting still the rest of his life. He refused the operation. So, one might ask, what was the good of this remarkable rehabilitation center in the case of Ansar? (laughs) 
It was here that Dr. Sohaso, an Indonesian surgeon, began operating on and repairing as best he could the victims of the six years of bitter fighting in that area. And all the time he thought of the problems that would face these incapacitated men and women. So at the end of the war, he looked for a place to continue rehabilitation work. And the only place available was a garage. And people came to him for help, garage or no garage. There were too many with bodies often too damaged to be given aid in this place. Everything was crude except the good intentions. So, Dr. Soharso looked around for help. But how could he expect anyone to notice his problems in a remote corner of Indonesia? Nevertheless, it did happen. He went on with his work, and in time, word of what was being done at Solo reached the United Nations. The UN sent the well-known American rehabilitation expert, Dr. Henry Kessler, to Solo to observe and report. And it was Dr. Kessler's conviction that the work being done at Solo was unique in that part of the world and could be a model for the whole area. After that, the story becomes one of a remarkable bit of cooperation among government, the United Nations, and many agencies and organizations. Now, there is an orthopedic hospital teaching program, a surgery and all the modern requirements, laundry, kitchen, hot water, sanitation facilities. Also, a brace shop for making braces and artificial limbs, and a vocational shop. But our young friend, Ansor, gave no thought to an operation for himself. The fact of the matter was that and so was much too frightened. But in the ward, he soon made friends. One young fellow in particular interested him, a boy named Mardi. And so felt so sorry for poor Mardi because Mardi's hands had been injured and were useless to him. And And so brooded about this so much, he discussed it with the nurses and learned that Mardi could be helped if he would submit to a series of operations. After all, even though And himself had troubles, he did have the use of his hands. Well, it seemed to answer a terrible pity that Mardi didn't let them operate. Finally, he had to speak to Mardi, tell him he must let the doctors help. Well, maybe it seems ironic, but Anso was quite shocked when he learned Mardi felt the same way toward him. Pitied him. He, Anso, felt he should let the doctors operate. And so they argued about their cases, kept trying to argue each other to the operating table, until it became a case of, I will if you will. Well, at that point, Ansor couldn't let his friend Mardi go first. He had too much pride for that. So, although Ansor was terrified, he rode into the operating room. And later, when he was on his crutches learning to walk, he had the privilege of giving courage to his friend Mardi. Now, here they are, both recovering and telling each other all about their operations. And that is how two lives were transformed in a garage in Solo, a tiny spot on the map of Indonesia. While polio is beaten, it still threatens our children today. You can help kill this disease for good by going to npolio.org. Once there, just read the information and then decide how you can help. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have a story from Young Readers Science Fiction Stories. This 1957 book contains 13 pre-space exploration stories for young readers. Now, some of the details in these stories show their dated composition, but the sense of adventure will still hold the attention for both the young and old alike. The story we have this time is Chapter 2, Gib Takes a Space Test. It is read for us by David Wells, and, well, I hope you enjoy it. Story 2, Gib Takes a Space Test Gib Bromfield was nine, and the thing he wanted to do most was to make a flight into space. 
A colony on the moon had already been started for scientific research, and a huge man-made space platform circled the Earth once every 24 hours. I want to go back to the moon with you, father, Gim would plead every time Mr. Broomfield came home on a furlough. I'm afraid you're still a little young, Gib, his father would reply. Some day you will be able to go out into space with me, but not yet. Mr. Bromfield was a construction engineer, and he was helping to build a big spaceport on the moon. He came home to see his family every six months. Each time he returned, Gib couldn't wait to meet him at the front door of their prefabricated home. Gib would shake hands with him like a man and take his bags from him. Then he would step back and admire the tall, handsome man in the glossy black boots and gray uniform of the space service. By this time, Mother usually came running up, followed by Sandra, Gib's little sister. On Mr. Bromfield's latest visit, Gib waited until the usual family talk had subsided before he started asking his father about his recent adventures. After father had brought him up to date, Gib asked the same question he always asked. Father, may I go back with you this time for a short visit? Just a short one? Mr. Bromfield smiled and rumpled Gib's blonde hair. It's not the time element, Gib, he said patiently. It's the rigors of space itself, which are much rougher than Captain Rocket on TV would have us believe. Gib's face fell. He had hoped that this time his father would give in and let him go back. Mr. Bromfield could see that his son was disappointed. He stared at Gib thoughtfully for a moment, then spoke again. All right, Gib, I'll put you through SQT. If you pass it and still want to go spaceward, I'll take you. Gee, do you mean that? Gib burst out. He was so excited he didn't know what to do. Gib had never had any doubt that he would pass the SQT, the space qualification test, that all those who go spaceward must take. Mr. Bromfield went immediately to the video phone and put through a call to SQT, having them place Gib's name on the space test list. Thanks, father, Gib said excitingly. At last I'll be going spaceward. We'll see, Mr. Bromfield replied soberly. Gib spent the next afternoon on the first part of the test, which was a complete physical examination. It didn't hurt the tiniest bit, Gib joked with his father that night. If all the parts of the test are as easy as this first one, I won't have any trouble. Mr. Bromfield did not say anything, but he smiled to himself as though he knew something that Gib did not know. Gib and his father took the elevated expressway to the SQT Center early the next morning in their atom-powered Johnson Superjet. The final portions of Gib's test would be covered today. The first part was familiarity with the spacesuit. In company with about 50 other candidates, Gib was given a supply of clothing. Then everyone was shown how to zip up their thickly insulated suits in front. Next, an attendant snapped metal cylinders to their shoulders and screwed the flexible tubings into valves on their suits. Last to be put on were helmets of light metal that had a darkened glass in front so that the wearer could look out. Now, all of you turn a little black knob on your chests, the tester said. His voice sounded muffled to Gib because of the helmet he wore. Gib turned his knob and felt his suit blowing up like a balloon as air flowed in from the oxygen tanks. This is how you would be dressed for a walk on the moon, the tester told them. Now, I want all of you to walk into the next room. As Gib went into the room with the others, he was thinking how easy the test had been up until now, and what fun it was taking the very tests that Captain Rocket himself must have taken at one time. He thought his father was surely mistaken for having doubted his ability to pass the SQT. The tester left the room and shut the door. In a few moments, Gib began to have a strange sensation. He was feeling lighter and lighter, and the others with him were beginning to float right off the floor. Gib struggled frantically as he felt himself go off balance. Each movement he made, however, shot him off at swift, crazy angles. He felt himself sweating with fear, and for the first time he was believing that maybe the SQT wasn't going to be so easy after all. It seemed as if he had the strength of a Samson, but it was a strength he could not control. A simple kick sent him hurtling across the room toward the wall. 
He tried to break himself, but nothing he did would stop him. He crashed headlong into the wall. It shook him up a little, but he was not hurt. He saw that the wall was thickly padded. After about fifteen minutes of helplessness, Gib felt himself getting heavier again and saw his companions drop to the floor in normal position. The tester came in with some doctors. The doctors looked over each candidate and asked many questions. Gib was still dazed and wasn't sure of the answers he gave. When the doctors were through, the tester explained what had happened. This room was degravitized, which means the Earth's gravity in here was cut off by mechanical means. It's the same condition you will find in a spaceship when the gravity plates are turned off. From the looks of some of you, this experience was something of a shock. But the final test will be even rougher. Anybody who wants to drop out now may do so. Gibb saw that about a third of the candidates had had enough. Gibb was still giddy himself and started to join them. He was disappointed in the harshness of zero gravity. It had always looked so simple to him the way that Captain Rocket swam about in his rocket flyer. Gibb did not want his father to think him a quitter, though, and decided to stick out the test to the end. When his turn came, he was led into a huge room by himself and up to a queer-looking machine. It resembled one of the thrill rides at a carnival, the one that whirls you round and round like a ball on the end of a string. Gibb entered a tiny cabin at the end of the large swinging arm and sat down in a thick foam-rubber reclining chair. As he was strapped down, the tester said to him, This is called the centrifuge, son, and it simulates the blast-off from Earth in a rocket ship. You appear to be a little young to be taking it, so if you've had enough, just yank that lever in front of you and we'll stop the machine. Uh, I will, Gibb replied, getting scared already. He got more scared as all sorts of instruments were strapped to him. The tester explained that these were to record his reactions. As the door was closed on him, Gibb had a trapped feeling. Then he composed himself and waited for the worst, telling himself that a spaceman must be brave. Presently he felt the cabin begin to move, slowly at first. This much was fun, Gibb thought, just like the carnival ride. As the cabin picked up speed, it was even more thrilling. But then, as the speed increased still more, Gibb began to lose his enjoyment. Faster and faster he went, and Gibb was crushed deeply into the chair cushion. He felt his cheeks draw back from his teeth, the corners of his eyes making him squint. There was heavy pressure on his chest, as if an elephant were standing on him. His breath hung in his throat, and he saw strange colors and darting forms before his eyes. He stood the agonizing effect as long as he could, and then his frightfully heavy hand crept unsteadily toward the lever in front of him and jerked it. The cabin began losing speed and finally stopped. Gibb saw a blurred image open the door and offer his hand. As he stumbled out, his head feeling big as a watermelon, Gibb vaguely remembered hearing the tester say, You needn't feel badly about this, son. You almost lasted it out. Come back in another year or two, and then I think you'll be able to pass. Gibb still wasn't quite himself as he met his father in the waiting room. He was quivering all over, and his dad wouldn't quite come into focus. I flunked the test, father, Gibb told him. It sounds to me as if you're glad you did, Mr. Bromfield replied with a chuckle. I was afraid it might be too rough for you, son, but I knew there was no other way to show you that space travel isn't as easy as the comic books make out. I'll try again next year, Gibbs said, or the year after that anyway. That's what the tester told me. I'm sure you'll be ready then, Mr. Bromfield replied. Now, what do you say we go home? Captain Rocket is almost due on TV. End of story two. My thanks to all of you listening. You're why I do this each week, and the folks at Lipson tell me that the number just keeps going up. However, 
On the radio side, I can only guess how many of you are out there. So, if you listen on the radio, drop me a quick note and tell me where and how you listen to the show. I really want to know. Coming up next week will be either episode 294 or The Horror Express number 17. If you want to keep up with what's happening on Ron's Amazing Stories, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or sign up for the weekly newsletter. All the links you'll need and access to the blog can be found at ronsamazingstories.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.